Well, I think that um, reflecting on white supremacy in New Mexico and, you know, I, I don't live in New Mexico anymore. I didn't grow up in New Mexico. You know, I spent my 30s, my late 20s and my 30s living in New Mexico, did my graduate work, formed the Red Nation, you know, like New Mexico has really influenced the, like the the, pol- the racial and like the colonial politics of New Mexico have really influenced my political development and just, you know, who I am as a person. But being here now in Minnesota, um, reflecting on the week. So on Friday night, so the National Women's Studies Association, which is the largest kind of feminist and queer studies association in the country, and I think the world, had their annual conference in Minneapolis, in downtown Minneapolis this week. Um, I think today might be the last day. And uh, they completely failed to include local organizers um, on the agenda. But after a series of missteps and mistakes, created a few sessions that were free to the public, but also for conference goers um, on Friday night. Unfortunately, they were all at the same time. So it was basically um, giving a platform to like grassroots Black women organizers and then grassroots Indigenous women organizers doing incredible work um, in the Twin Cities and in like the larger state of Minnesota about things. And I could only attend two of them because like I said, they were all happening at the same time, which is like a poor reflection of the conference committee organizers. But um, the first session was led by three uh, incredible Black women who are doing work on maintaining the protest at George Floyd Memorial Square, which is at 30th in Chicago and South Minneapolis. And, uh, you know, listening to them talk. And then after that session, there was a session of three indigenous women. Um, I think all of whom were Anishinaabeg. One was also Dakota and Anishinaabeg who are doing um, very in-depth community-based research for something called the Truth Commission, uh, which is towards recognition and university tribal healing, i.e. truth. Um, And the Truth Commission really came out of indigenous nations, the the 11 indigenous nations that are current within the current boundaries of the state of Minnesota. Um, The tribal leadership got together uh, and studied the land grab university article that came out two and a half years ago in High Country News. And so they decided to do um, implement a research project researching um, the history of the University of Minnesota's relationship with indigenous nations. Now, of course, like this, this approach like completely erases Dakota people who were removed and, you know, who are actually like, I think now reside in like Crow Creek and in other um, reservations that are now in the current state of South Dakota. And they have not been as included in the project. And so, you know, that's something that probably should be rectified in the future. But I listened to like after the session that was being led by these powerful um, grassroots black women who are leading and organizing the longest protest in U.S. history. (laughs) So what's happening in Minneapolis is like just because the conflagration died down does not mean the protest has ended. And this was one of their important messages. And they're like, so what are you going to continue to do to like support this movement that values right and really liberates black life? Um, And so obviously for most people who know anything about the recent history of where I now live, like that is a very important, like one of the most important struggles, I think in the history of struggle in the United States. And that's here, right? The epicenter, it started here and it's still ongoing. And so right right as soon as I ended that session, then I went into the truth commission session with these indigenous women who've been researching this history. And let me tell you, like the university of Minnesota is the death star. Um, It's now my employer and I'm like, every day, every day I'm like, I can't believe I work here. Um, It makes me want to leave the academy more so, much more so than the University of New Mexico or the University of California Riverside ever did because the University of Minnesota benefit. So the, uh, gosh, I don't know the history entirely, but the Dakota and the Anishinaabe lands that are now within the current state boundaries of Minnesota The treaties of 1851 and 1862 um, that were, right, so these treaties were, they're quote unquote treaties, but essentially they were agreements that that were struck and designed by architects of genocide and specifically, really specifically Dakota genocide. The hanging of the Dakota 38 and Manhato, Mankato, it's like the white version, um, which is right down the road where um, Minnesota State University is. Um, And then like the fort, the starvation, the um, the 
imprisonment and then like the death marching of Dakota people, um, their, their very forceful removal from these homelands, like all of that happened. Some of the founding regents board from the, for the board of regents for the university of Minnesota were like very much engaged in the genocidal campaigns specifically against Dakota people because they wanted, because Dakota people were incredibly successful for a long period of time of resisting like the settlement, um, they were, you know, they won, they were winning certain battles, like their resistance was very powerful. And so within six weeks, I think after um, Dakota people were removed, and political and spiritual leaders were assassinated by President Lincoln, in collaboration with these men, people like George Sibley, and what's his face, Ramsey, these powerful Robin robber barons, basically of, of Minnesota at that time, uh, Six weeks after Dakota removal, um, these these gentlemen, many of whom were the founding board, were the founding regents of the University of Minnesota, grabbed all of that land. It was the largest land. Um, it was the largest theft of indigenous land through treaty um, in the U.S. If I, I could be wrong, but I think that's correct. And the University of Minnesota was the largest beneficiary of that land. And so land grant institutions, New Mexico State University is a land grant institutions. Essentially, what that means is that through the Morrill Act um, and through these acts of seizing land, the university was able to develop that land or sell that land or chop it into pieces and sell it off as private property to settlers, right? Um, and from the money that they have gained from the land that they acquired through genocide, um, Dakota genocide, we're basically able to build the very first endowment um, for the institution. And it's called the Permanent Puff, Permanent Something Fund, Public something puff, something fund, which is basically an endowment for the university. And that endowment continues to grow. Um, they've been able to invest money from that endowment into other endeavors. And so I think like it, they haven't quite calculated it yet, but the University of Minnesota has made billions, billions of dollars off of the Gen Dakota genocide primarily, but also like the removal and the theft of Anishinaabe or Ojibwe land. Um, and like, I didn't know that the anthropologist who was the primary architect of blood quantum as an early genocidal and um, eugenics uh, project of assimilation or method of assimilation was actually a University of Minnesota professor um, as well. And that also, like the University of Minnesota through its use of PUF funds has been able to like fund other kinds of like deeply anti-Indian projects in other places and places like Massachusetts. Um, and the, the land that was seized through land grants, um, Dakota and Anishinaabeg land in what is now Minnesota fed Cornell university. Um, and I think it fed like about a dozen other universities, most of which were in the East and the South, um, in what is now the United States. And so like when I call the university of Minnesota, the death star, it's because the reach is is truly national, um, and like what the university has done with the the money it's made off of the theft of this land, and like the ethnic cleansing of Dakota people is like astounding. So like my office and the American Indian Studies Department are we have like the worst offices on campus. We like literally do. We're like in the worst building, on the worst floor. It's like a fucking haunted boarding school from the 40s is what our building feels like and it's in what i feel like is probably one of the oldest parts of campus it's this like fancy old red brick brick building and every time i have to go into this building i'm just like these bricks were literally built out of the blood of dakota people quite literally the foundation of this university was genocide quite literally the money that built that brick and those settlers probably who laid that brick you know, and the people who would, ha I don't know how brick is made, but like using the land and the earth and baking it into that brick. And like, that's the foundation of the building I now have to be in as an indigenous faculty member. It's like so disgusting. <laughs> I So anyway, I know I just went on for a really long time about this, but it's incredibly, it is very important to understand like that the Truth Commission, right, and that the indigenous nations and that these women who are really in the front lines, they're in archives every day, like researching this stuff. They're finding like these hidden eugenics projects 
that University of Minnesota scientists used to conduct on like indigenous children from Red Lake, for example. One of the young women um, who was talking was from Red Lake and she was like, yeah, they removed kidneys from all of these children. And so there are also uh, thousands of indigenous remains that are still within the inventory and the possession of the University of Minnesota, um, like there are with many universities across the United States. And so there's this active effort being undertaken by people within the institution to abide by NAGPRA, the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, to you know rematriate those remains and those relatives back to the community so they can be handled correctly and laid to rest. Um, and so, yeah, so this is just something that I've been thinking a lot about and like wondering why I've been feeling this way <laughs> since I got to this place. Cause I've just, I've been having this feeling and I'm like, what the fuck? Like white supremacy, this is the other aspect of Minnesota, right? And this is, it helps to understand like why, why things had to be burned down in order for anyone to pay attention to like the extreme violence and of, of anti-blackness in this place. Granted, a lot of those fires were started by white supremacists who were posing as Antifa. So that's important <laughs> to, to pay attention to. But nevertheless, there is such like liberalism here is such that like the University of Minnesota, for example, in relationship to the Truth Commission, it is very important for liberals, specifically white liberals here. I'm not even going to talk about the fascists and the white supremacists. Outside of the Twin Cities um, is mostly red. It's like very conservative like the, the Kyle Rittenhouse kind of people. I mean, Kyle Rittenhouse is right across the border in Wisconsin, right? Kyle Rittenhouse who murdered um, those activists um, during the uprising of 2020. But the Kyle Rittenhouses of like the Midwest, they're all over the state of Minnesota as well. And they were descending upon the city during the 2020 uprising and like terrorizing neighborhoods, um, the, Amer the, the American Indian neighborhood called Phillips and the black neighborhoods, um, especially close to 38th in Chicago, which is, was like the, the epicenter of the uprising. And so it's important to know that there's like a very intense fascist white supremacy presence in Minnesota, but there's also like the white liberal of Minnesota, most of whom live in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And they are very, very invested in the like uh, presenting themselves or the image of being in solidarity. Um, it's a very vacuous and a very shallow and therefore a very dangerous type of like liberalism that is through its mouth is talking about like diversity, equity, and inclusion, this like commitment to multiculturalism. So you'll go into like the wealthy white liberal neighborhoods in South and Southwest Minneapolis. And everyone has like the thing, the signs on there, like they're, they have the signs about like water's life, black lives matter, love is love, you know, those things. But like the lawn that they have that sign on is the lawn in front of a mansion you know, a mansion, like a well manicured mansion. And so, but they drive a Tesla, but they drive a Tesla, you know, and they probably have like peaceful coexistence bumper stickers, you know, on their Tesla or whatever, <laughs> those things too, with like the peace sign in it. You know what I'm, mm -hmm. you know, coexist, you know what uh -huh. I'm talking about. Oh yes. So I'm sorry. I'm being so long winded. It's just like this week was a particular like flashpoint for me when it comes to all of this. And so those white liberal that that what that type of white supremacy that's refracted through liberalism here is more powerful than any place i have ever lived certainly new mexico isn't like this it's probably just because there's a shit ton of brown people actually and it's a very poor state minnesota is not it is not demographically the same as new mexico new mexico is like on the periphery of empire the twin cities is like the center of empire and it's because of the white supremacy in the rural parts, but it's because of the white liberals here who are deeply invested in the image, the public image of being down with diversity, but are with that Minnesota nice kind of attitude, but are like so fucking racist. <laughs> and so they present in a certain way, but they will like do anything to stop, to malign, to discredit and to delegitimize like black liberation in this place and indigenous liberation in this place. And so struggle here is so repressed and suppressed. It's like having being in a straight jacket or something. It's like you can see what's going on and you're screaming, but you're like in a padded room. 
it's really creepy. This place is disgusting. And the erasure, the like just the willful erasure of genocide, the genocide of like black folks and the genocide of indigenous folks, specifically Dakota people, the fact that 27 or 28 percent of native people in Minnesota live in poverty. The fact that like you see all the only people you see panhandling in Minneapolis are indigenous and black people. The only people you see mm -hmm. to be homeless in your own homelands like that is this place. <laughs> and I work at a university that has a lot of power, has a lot of power and has gained that power and that wealth quite literally off of genocide. And so New Mexico, you know, can be very white supremacist in Arizona, but this place, especially the Twin Cities, it's extremely racist. And like the whiteness here, like maintains its comfort through like the suppression of any kind of alternative or any kind of like pushback, right? A liberatory struggle even to call out that whiteness here, it's so quickly either crushed because of like the the conservative right wing aspects, or it's crushed by that those liberal liberal overtures. The University of Minnesota cracks really quickly when you push a little bit harder, and 